now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 7.06 here in the Monday morning. Bloodbath continues. It's O'Connor and Company. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, you ain't seen a bloodbath. You have no idea what kind of bloodbath we've got in store for us. 7.35, Janine Yunus, New Civil Liberties Alliance. Today is the day the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments there in that case involving the state of Missouri against the government's social media censorship. And uh, we will hear it straight from Janine there about uh, how that is going to come down. 805, Mike Litteris, National Park Service on the Cherry Blossom situation. And then at 835, Scott Smith. Dad out in Loudoun County will give us the latest with that school system. I'm Larry O'Connor, alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Are you ready for the bloodbath? I am. You have participated in a bloodbath all morning, so many. by the way. And well, how dare and you? in the past, so well, many. You have no idea. <laughs> Jody Genovese, he's, he's seen his uh, fair share of bloodbaths. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. <laughs> I mean, remember right when you you think they can't get more shameless? When you think, I mean, honestly, this bloodbath thing is probably uh but will they ever learn they don't care they clearly don't yeah. care the media about the truth and about facts we've known that for a long time but this one is so blatant does it make an impact though or they just they have their built-in audience that only comes to them because they hear what they want to hear and that's the beginning and end of it well i think lying by the media has a cumulative impact uh, on the society in general in terms of disillusionment debasing public discourse, which, of course, is something they're supposed to improve, hmm. and they're debasing it. Um, it's, a, it's an institutional dilemma for everybody because we need a, a free media, but we don't have it. Uh, what we have is a corrupt media. And I know people don't like saying when Trump says enemy of the people, but the problem with it is that's closer to the truth than a lot of people in the media would like to admit. They really are creating problems in a democracy, and they are they're, they have become the enemy of the people for the very reason that you've given. They lie, and they lie with impunity. They hate Trump so much that that's their goal, to defeat him. And no matter what the cost or the price, and if, even if it means totally debasing the currency of a free press, and that's what they've, they've chosen. They've chosen sides. Yeah. For the well, most part, the mainstream media is in that category. Well said, Joe DeGeneva. Um, speaking of debasing a flawed but vital institution. <laughs> the decision out of Fulton County, Judge Scott McAfee, they're calling it Solomon-esque by splitting the baby. But as I pointed out earlier, you know, let's not celebrate splitting a baby because you end up with a dead baby. And this idea that, well, one of them has to go, either Nathan Wade or Fannie Willis. If you're saying that one of them has to go, you're saying that there's an inappropriate relationship and there's conflict. And if you're saying it's inappropriate and there's conflict, that means Fannie Willis lied under oath. You can't yeah. have it both yeah. ways. Explain this to me, Joe. Well, the, the ruling is an exercise in cognitive dissonance. The judge didn't want to reach the proper conclusion, so he tried to look like he was doing it. You, I had to read the opinion several times in order to really understand it. Well, that's not his a good sign right is, there. <laughs> that's right. His, his basic ruling was one liar stays and one liar goes. Hmm. Now, go. the defendants, according to him, failed to meet their burden to prove an actual conflict. That conclusion is ludicrous. The defendants met their burden in every conceivable way. And the judge proves it himself because he then shortly goes on and says, the significant appearance of impropriety infects the current structure of the prosecution team with the odor of mendacity. Now, I'm sorry. Huh. If there's an odor of mendacity, if there's an odor of lying, that means everybody was lying. And he then says this appearance must be removed. And, and, and then he says the Willis-Wade testimony was not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable. It was like reading a novel. And so the bottom line is this, is that his decision is ludicrous on its face. And he, he, he goes on to say, by the way, just because I'm ruling this way doesn't mean that I condone the tremendous lapse of judgment uh, that was demonstrated by Willis or the unprofessional manner of her testimony during the evidentiary hearing. He should have referred her to the bar. 
yeah. for her entire testimony during the proceeding. He should have referred Wade to the bar. He should have referred Bradley to the bar. But he punts. He says, other people are looking at the, uh, for example, the inaccurate interrogatories that Mr. Wade gave in his civil proceeding. He says that showed a willingness to wrongfully conceal his relationship with Willis. The more you read the opinion, you go and you say, wait a minute, he's reaching all these conclusions and he finally they didn't meet their burden. I mean, it's just it's just ludicrous. So the bottom line is it's it's intellectually dishonest uh, and it's a it's a ruling that should be appealed. And I hope that the team that represents all the defendants will ask the judge to issue a special order certificate so that they can appeal it to a higher court because well, it's a disgraceful ruling. It really is a disgraceful ruling. It's totally embarrassing. But do you think it was political? He recently, oh, yes. right before this this uh, oh. this decision came down, the former executive director of Rainbow Push Coalition, Robert Padillo, came out and said that he's going to run against him. So did he literally make this this ruling entirely based on his own ambitions? Of course he did, um, because the opinion he said this is this is the the, the last well, in the last paragraph he says, I hope this opinion will instill confidence in the process. <laughs> <laughs> he actually writes that in the opinion. His problem is that everyone saw the same proceeding that he ruled in. He thinks this was a private hearing. This was a hearing in which millions and millions of Americans watched the testimony, and made judgments about the veracity of all the participants. His judgment that he couldn't show that, they, that the defense didn't meet their burden was belied by all the evidence that millions of Americans saw. This guy looks like, a, like an idiot, and it's fairly obvious. He was on a radio show shortly before his ruling was issued, and he said that he was not affected by the entry into the race of two other people because he had a draft already done before they entered. Now, if you have to say that yeah. and you have to go on radio <laughs> to explain your ruling, you shouldn't be a judge anymore. This guy is a real simp this guy's a simpleton. Great point. Is this uh is this appealable? What 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 does Team Trump do or technically Team Roman? Mike they, Roman is the one. They have to get the permission. It's this is what they call an interlocutory appeal, which means during the proceedings. As you might imagine, appeals during the beginning of a proceeding are, are, shun, are, are generally not favored by courts because they're not over yet, because there's a trial that's supposed to be held, and they have the right, they can preserve the issue for appeal. But something like this that involves the essence of the prosecution function is so important that it seems to me if I were the judge, I would issue what's called a certificate of appeal, which is something a trial judge can issue, which allows someone to file an interlocutory appeal. I hope that the defendants all ask for it. And if he's smart, he'll grant it. Uh, if he denies it, he's going to have a trial with 18 defendants a lot sooner than he would like. I, I think he wants to avoid a mass trial in a gymnasium with 18 defendants. Can you imagine the objections? during something like that. I, I, I can't even imagine how you try a case like this. Nor can I. We'll have to leave it there, Joe. But great insights, as always. And uh, we shall see where this goes from here. What a what a time to be alive doing what we're doing for a living. Yes. Happy bloodbath day. <laughs> <laughs> and happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way, belatedly. He's the, he's the most Irish uh, Italian that you'll ever find. In the in the there you go. See, I told you. <laughs> I thanks, love it. Thanks, Joe. Bye. <laughs> it's 7.15, WMAL, traffic and weather every 10 minutes, first on the fives. Little Italian leprechaun, that's what we need in our <laughs> life. Lord, They do make great food, though, you have to admit. Mm. No, no offense to Irish food, but given the choice.